Yes, right here, right now. We've got Judge Joe Brown should be calling in. Dr. Umar Johnson should be calling in. And we want to, I love this, contrast and compare a few things. The nature and scope of Hollywood, Judge Joe Brown. The breakup of the black African family, if you will. The need for black parenting, Dr. Umar Johnson should be calling in. Hey, look, and we're going to talk a little bit about Bill Cosby. All right, so as soon as uh, they get ready, we'll be ready. Omar Baruti, Cedric Curveson, Isaac Wooderich, and yours truly, right here, AM 730, KQPN. AM 1600, WMQPN, 901-452-3094, Grab a line. Get on the phone. Hey, look, we're taking your questions and comments. All right, we're, we're going to talk about, we've got Judge Joe Brown on the phone. Judge Joe Brown, how are you, sir? All right. Great day, my brother. Yes, sir. Great day. Great day. But let's start off. I want to start off with this one. The nature and scope of Hollywood. Because you and I have talked about that a lot. I've heard you talking about it. We mentioned it last week. We didn't, we had, we've got 30 minutes to work on this today. Go right ahead, sir. All right. You see the article in Esquire? I didn't see it. Billy D. Williams comes out the closet. What? Did you see it over? Yeah. No. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> I know he didn't like black women, but <laughs> he liked that though. <laughs> yeah. Omar said no, he didn't. He didn't like black women, but he didn't know he was like that. <laughs> he says he came out claimed to be gender fluid. He doesn't consider himself a male or female. He's both. Wow. Etc. 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 Yeah. Uh, well, you know, and <laughs> he talks about his favorite role was playing in Brian's song as Gil Sayers, the Chicago Bear football player. And he talks about being the roommate of another football player and he called it a love story between two guys mm -hmm. but you know it's see this is what we get it's their right to do what the hell they want to do no problem but you have a right and you have to juxtapose the right up against obligation and responsibility you don't if you're going to deal with obligation, you're supposed to be what you ought to be. Mm -hmm. You can be a damn fool, but <laughs> you should be something else. to <laughs> 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 have some good common sense. Right. And we have a problem in our neighborhoods because they have become matriarchies. Mm -hmm. And Hollywood is pushing that. Pushing it very, very, very hard. We don't have a masculine component in our neighborhoods. And that means that the young males are being taught to be girls. And it's kind of strange. It's like if you had some kind of fairy running around with a magic wand, and he took your typical lesbian out of the hood, waved the magic wand overnight, and they woke up with a penis the next morning. You'd have your typical male component in the hood. Uh, both are raised as girls. Both like girls sexually, but the guys have boy plumbing. And that's about the extent of it because they don't have this masculine ideation. They hear their 13-year-old aunts in the back of their minds, uh, from an incident when they were six or seven years old and they ideate on getting some body of the opposite sex to take care of. That's the way 
girls have ideated for a long time finding some man to move them on up in life. Mm-hmm. But they don't hear it that way because they don't have any men around to tell them to the contrary. Real men, they have adult males who haven't done what's necessary to, to, to have the manhood component. And they look at it as live off the opposite sex. I would be on the bench and I'd be sentencing some young guy and I'd say, for the court is disposed to grant you probation, young man, would you please tell the court how you uh, are going to manage to earn a living? The, I, the court does not see this from your probationary court. Yo, Yana, like, uh, I got four ladies take good care of me. Two got J, good J-O-Bs. One get a crazy check, and the other one get AFDC. She takes good care of me. <laughs> well, what do you do? Well, I make them feel smooth. I smooth them out so they can cope with their day. Mm-hmm. What do you do? Well, I mean, ain't that enough, Your Honor? <laughs> oh, please. You know, come on. Where is this thing going? And you see, you get it on manhood. I, I hate to harp on this movie like Black Panther was a blockbuster and black people made it happen. As a matter of fact, the theater that sold the most tickets was a paradiso here in Memphis. And that's in all of the United States, including uh, Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, Dallas, Houston, Miami, Detroit, you name it. Mm-hmm. And looked at Black Panther. He had two tall female bodyguards who were supposed to be his bodyguards. But if you listen carefully, they nagged him through the whole movie, telling him what to do, what not to do. Mm-hmm. And he walked in a place looking like a pimp with two hoes with it. You know, mm-hmm. his mother ran the country, but he's the king. His aunt took care of all the foreign affairs, but he's the king. He's running around in tights playing vigilante for some crazy white folk that got off, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, you looked in the, uh, marketplace when you saw that, you didn't see any, uh, men doing anything except toting and fetching. When you got into the halls of science, you didn't see a single man except one pushing a cart way in the background. Mm-hmm. The only male was that guy with the lip, uh, circle and, you know, corresponding to a preacher with that lime green coat and the orange tie looking like a clown. Mm-hmm. You, saw them having to go deal with getting a white ex-CIA guy to play their pilot in a virtual aircraft. You saw the penultimate battle was between the men of the tribe and the women of the tribe, and the women were trying to kill the men with spears, guns, knives, swords, a bow and arrow, you name it. And then the women went and betrayed the whole tribe by going outside to get reinforcements. And we went up into the mountains where there was snow on the ground and their allies lived in caves. And you can get the inference about generally men uh, are supposed to be cavemen from that whole thing. Mm -hmm. The villain was... uh, Killmonger, and they actually had him quoting Malcolm X, Marcus <laughs> Garvey, W.B. Du Bois, Martin Luther King, H. Rap Brown, Huey P. Newton, Stokely Carmichael, but they made him the villain. And as a matter of fact, when Stan Lee wrote the comic, he had the Black Panther more like Killmonger than he did the way they portrayed it in the movie. They had the guy that played Black Panther. Also, they had him playing, uh, oh, Jackie Robinson. They mm-hmm. had him playing Thurgood Marshall, and they had him playing some flamer in this movie, The Gods of Egypt. And you get this association since the first one would be the flamer, uh, that you've got this person who can be all of these different things from just flaming gay all the way to bad ass, you know, Black Panther. So, Judge, and let me ask you this. It was bad, image. Yeah, 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 let me ask you this. Do I hear you discussing the non-reality coming from Hollywood, the movie producers, and do you, do I hear you discussing 
black people, if you will, African Americans, playing I into hear- non reality stuff. Yeah, I do, but I yes. but also the subtle and not so message that they've got the black characters playing. In other words, okay. you if you're going to be a man, you're one thing. You don't sit there and passively let your women run everything for you and then direct your force someplace that may be ridiculous. You don't sit there and put yourself when you get an advantage and allow uh, something to divert you from power and exercise of the power and you use it for in the movie white folks good ultimately in the end and you give it away you don't come in matching imagery that looks so much like something negative in our community the pimp walking in with a hoe on each arm you know that that kind of thing you cause young kids to ideate to uh, seek to be like what you push you you don't do that kind mm-hmm. of thing. That's what I'm talking about. Okay, Jesse Williams here. We who just came out the closet. Right. What does that say about what all the women and the men have been ideating about being or trying to act like all these years? Right. I've got I've got two or three more interesting questions for you. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go a little longer than we had planned. We've got uh, Dr. Umar Johnson on the other end, but let's go. Dr. Hello, Umar, doctor. How you doing? Hold on, and we're going to go a little longer than we had planned coming right to you. Uh, 901-324-7490, or you may call at 901-452-3094. We've got Dr. Umar Johnson. We've got Judge Joe Brown. And call in with your questions or comment. Judge Joe Brown, what is your major criticism of Hollywood, and what would you do differently? Because we are talking about black people, African Americans. Go ahead, sir. Well, to start with Hollywood, it, it goes to the fundamental core of Hollywood. It is the most racist institution I've worked in in my 72 years. It's low down, they're backstabbed, they're vicious, they have no moral scruples, they have no ethical principles when they deal with each other and that leaks over into what they put out in the public Mm -hmm. they don't try anymore to with their exceptions but they don't try anymore to push principle honor and obligation they push hedonistic dysfunction and do what you want to do to hell with everybody else Mm -hmm. Uh, they can't even come up with a new movie these days they always are trying to redo something because they've run out of ideas because they don't think in terms of the traditional story that's put before people whether you're talking the caveman or you're talking shakespeare or an old uh black and white movie it was usually you talked about human nature and you had a positive message either you don't do this because you don't prosper or you do this and you do or you do this because you had to even if you die in the process which is a you know a good thing so they push principle now they don't it's just nihilistic garbage half mm-hmm. the time and they don't even know why it works or don't, doesn't work mm-hmm. so we follow this whole thing and we don't have any masculinity in our neighborhoods anymore No black men telling folk what they ought to do and what not to do. A son, don't do this, son. This is the way you do that. A young man, here's how you do this. Here's how you don't do that. And the ideation that our community gets is from Hollywood, and it's a poisonous source. You know, what is this for saying? Fruit don't fall too far from the tree. And if you're eating that fruit, you know, you get the same poison that you got from the root of the tree. Okay, the let's transition to the breakup of the black family. Let me hear your perspective on that. And here's what I think we should do. I think since Dr. Umar Johnson's on the line, let's just go back and forth, comments and questions from you, then Dr. Umar, like that. Uh, you go on this uh, first, okay. Joe Brown. Yes. Briefly. Go ahead. Uh, 1974, I was with legal services there in Memphis. Yes. And one of the most frequent cases was getting the check cut back on after they cut it off when a social worker spied uh, one or two of the fathers of the seven or eight children in the household trying to interact with his children, and they said no. So that is the start of a campaign to exclude black men from the family. Okay. 
and that got worse. So we have no masculine input into these children. Mm -hmm. That is a bad thing. All we right. have got to do something about that. Oh, absolutely. Dr. Umar Johnson, welcome to the Love Power Show, sir. Good morning uh, to everyone, and good morning to Judge Joe Brown. Yes, sir. Good morning to Judge Joe Brown. We've got Omar Baruti with us, Cedric Kerberson, and myself, Wallace Red. We've got Dr. Umar Johnson on the line right now. Give us a call right here at 901-452-3094 or call us at 901-324-749. Zero AM sixteen hundred or AM seven thirty. Doctor Umar Johnson, let us talk. Starting out with the breakup of the black family. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. There is a notion in the black community that slavery destroyed the black family. Slavery was definitely a weapon against the black family, but it did not destroy it. All through slavery, Reconstruction. Jim Crow, early years of black power, most of our homes were headed by a man and a woman. We had perfect balance between masculine and feminine energy. You don't begin to see the decline of the two-parent black household until 1970. 1970 was the year where the single black mother took off in terms of being the head of our households, raising the children on her own. This was because that's the same decade that the United States government came into the black community in the aftermath of Dr. King's assassination in 68 to economically devastate and destroy the financial infrastructure of the black community to make sure we could not finance any more revolutions, movements, or rebellions. That's so right. Two things they did. They went into the high schools and they took out all of the industrial building trade programs. Yes. Up until 1970, there was no everyone needs to go to college narrative up until 1970 we were living comfortably as plumbers and engine uh, plumbers and electricians as uh, carpenters and welders and bakers and barbers we were doing fine mm -hmm. but they said we got to get rid of that economic infrastructure because that black man having his own business allows him to donate money to king he could donate money to malcolm he could donate money to the panthers we got mm -hmm. to kill all of that mm -hmm. so they took that out of the high schools and then they also took the factories out of the inner city so they killed the black man's ability to take care of his family 1970 1980 they dropped the crack cocaine off mm -hmm. so now the black man has a decision you could try to sell this dope to feed your family or you could smoke the dope to deal with the psychological pressure of not being able to provide. 1994, Bill Clinton's crime bill, which was basically mass incarceration on steroids for the first time in American history, mandatory minimum sentences for nonviolent drug-related offenses, three strikes and you're out. And not only that, we're going to cut millions of single black mothers off of welfare. So when you talk about taking the black man out the house, the... Economic devastation of the 70s, the crack of the 80s, and the Bill Clinton's crime bill of the 90s mm -hmm. completely destroyed the black man's ability to take care of his family and participate in that family. Because mm -hmm. one thing welfare programs did was it made it almost impossible for an abled body black man to remain in the household yes. in order for the woman to get benefits for her children. Even today, right now, if you are in public housing, you cannot have an ex-offender live in that home. So when the father comes home, if that mother is with her children in federally funded housing, he cannot be caught in that home. If he is, they will put her and her children out on the street. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned uh, black people getting married. There is a book, and the name of the book is The Odyssey of the African American. And that book, there's a chapter where it talks about the slave ship arriving on these shores and people were getting off these black people, these ships, these ships rather, and looking around, looking for their loved ones. And even after that, they, like you said the other day on YouTube, they were still getting married. And when I was a young man growing up, I, I recognized something. I didn't know what it was in the 70s and 80s and 90s. You're exactly right. And so... Up until recently, we were getting married in relationships and building families. And so now 
is the question a matter of, let me shift to Judge Joe Brown, is it a matter of rebuilding economically and establishing businesses in this country, in our communities, especially for black men, uh, black men, Judge Joe Brown. We've got uh, Omar Baruti here, Cedric Kerberson, Isaac Woodridge. Give us a call right here, 901-452-3094, 901-324-7490. Go ahead, Judge Brown. Then we'll take a question, a uh, comment from Omar Baruti. The tragic thing about what we're running into now is that we do have a class of very hardworking black men who are conscientious and, for the most part, directed. But they have become isolated, and they're not mainstream in our community. I can't hear the judge. I remember back in 1972. He, I was he said in. he can't hear the judge. Well, okay. I'm I don't think it's going to hear him, though. I think maybe very uh, hard some of the volume, maybe. Men who are isolated and are no longer part of the mainstream black society. That's unfortunate. But I was also saying in 1972, when I was with this D.C. think tank as an intern, I remember I had an assignment to study the slave pamphlets on microfilm in the Library of Congress. And unfortunately, the program they were laying out to the slave owners was a long-term generational plan, and it's still, still ongoing. They considered black people to be two-legged livestock, and they wanted them to breed, and they weren't concerned about the efficacy of a family. They were trying to eliminate it so there would be random, sporadic, and frequent breeding. We get that now. They did not want the male to be part of any decision-making change, so they taught the female slaves that they were to be in charge, and they would not ever deal with a senior male. They would always deal with a senior female. Mm -hmm. So they were encouraging a female head of household. Mm -hmm. They ideated that the slave owner could make slaves, but the mother of the slave could make him a better slave than he could. So he was encouraged to put this ideation in a generational basis in the black woman's head about how to raise our children so they would be slaves, good slaves, when they grew up. Now, a certain segment of our black population got away from that, but we aren't breeding like the other segment are. We aren't having a whole bunch of kids. We aren't incentivized by a collective remembrance of the welfare program they had a little while ago. And when they kept adding a bigger check to a bigger brood of kids, mm -hmm. that really sent things downhill. So right now, we've got to turn things around so we put manhood back in our neighborhood. Okay. That is the key. The key. Manhood All right. in the neighborhood. All right. We don't have it, but we got to get it back. All right. The Let's family, go. The family is the foundational unit of society. There you go. When you make the black man a pariah in his family, it's all going to hell for the particular ethnic group that does not have a solid family unit. So right. we have got to get the black man back in the family. All right. Dr. Omar, we're going to Omar Baruti right now. Go ahead, Omar. I, I, I'd like to know, uh, you know, it looked like the church went in the closet when these gay people came out. <laughs> the church uh, went in the closet. They went in the closet. The gay people were <laughs> in the closet. They came out of the closet. Uh, yes. <laughs> And I'd like to know, what can we say to the church to make them, uh, you know, stand back up again and, and and preach against the illnesses that they see in the society and in the congregation? Hey, but that, that, man, that's a great one for Dr. Umar Johnson. Dr. Umar Johnson, did you hear Omar? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so now, remember now, I want to tie his question to my previous comment. Okay. But in the 1970s, they economically devastated the black community. 1980s, they brought in crack cocaine, chemical devastation. 1990s, uh, Bill Clinton crime bill, mass incarceration devastation. So what happened in the year 2000? Because every 10 years, white supremacy gives black America a new weapon of destruction. So in Y2K, the year 2000, former President George W. Bush takes office. He gives us the FBI. Faith-based faith initiative. Wow. He finds a way by which you can get federal money to churches, to black churches, because the Constitution says that there must be a separation between church and state. Yes. Well, President Bush found a loophole around that. He made the black church eligible to start federal grant. And so the reason why you haven't seen the black church at the forefront of any major struggle affecting black people, and what are those struggles? Mass incarceration, miseducation, gentrification, 
police genocide, and access to wealth. You can't name a black church that is at the forefront of any of those five major struggles that we have. You know why? Because since the year 2000, they've been getting subsidized by the federal government to stay out of the black liberation struggle. Now, the other point that needs to be made, the black church will never fall out of favor for, with black folks for two reasons. You will never get rid of black church. Number one, black church is the one institution that tells black people they can solve their problems without doing any work whatsoever. Black people, because of our psychological hypnosis that comes from slavery, we do not want to embrace reality. Mm -hmm. We do not believe in embracing the truth. Mm -hmm. Any organization, any leader that is willing to tell us a lie, mm -hmm. that is willing to tell us that you can fix all the problems you got and you don't have to do any work, all you have to do is pray and make a contribution to my church. As long as the church is telling black folks they can solve their problems without doing any work, they will never fall out of favor because black people are always willing to lend a favorable air to opportunists who tell us we don't have to sacrifice in order to get free. Mm -hmm. Just Joe Brown. Well, let me just say this. I don't want to step on anybody's feet, but how do you suppose the people is supposed that is just... going to get free if their religion is one that was force-fed to them for the specific purpose of oppressing them. Mm -hmm. Correct. I'll tell you, you know, I'll tell you something that I've noticed, and I hear them, I, and he, Dr. Umar Johnson pointed out, the preacher. I like that, and, and I like we're going to specifically identify who and what we're talking about. But I hear people, uh, these preachers talking about, as if they are talking directly to God, I talked to God, God talked back to me, and God told me to tell you that you don't have to work. You're absolutely right, Dr. Umar Johnson. Uh, take it away, yes. uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Judge Joe Brown. Go ahead, sir. Well, look, I, what I've heard is these days everybody talks about all you have to do is believe. You don't have to act in any certain way. All you got to do is believe if you want to get in hell. They don't talk about sin anymore. It's like you walk in the door and they'll tell you, if, if I've even heard the sermon uh, several times, you can be a drug dealer, a pimp, a killer, a robber, a thief, a rapist. It doesn't make any difference so long as you believe you'll get to see Jesus. Okay. Uh, and, I mean, like, why are you sitting there claiming to be a preacher and you're delivering a sermon that says it's okay to be all of these bad things? And all you got to do is believe. That's that's not helping us out. But they want that collection plate to continue to uh, get filled with paper, not coins. They want it filled with paper. <laughs> and we get paralyzed with that kind of thing. You walk into a meeting and you want to hear somebody give a lecture on how he managed to accomplish something. And what you get is he tells you he has been blessed. I don't want to hear that. Tell me what you did. Right. But you see, that's the way we have become trapped into a harmful ideation about things. Oh. Then what we turn around and we look at the ideation that Hollywood gives us that we flock to see, and it's essentially negative. Like, how much do you see people, how many times did you see people crowd into the Paradiso or other theaters in Memphis to see Tyler Perry playing, a, being a tranny, playing that fat, crazy Medea. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we go and flock into that kind of dysfunction. Absolutely. And we're going to talk more about the solution to this stuff. We've got a caller on the line. Go ahead, caller. You've got a question or comment for Judge Joe Brown, or, and also we've got Dr. Umar Johnson on the phone as well. Go ahead, man. Go ahead, man. Good morning. Uh, this is Gigi. How is everybody doing this morning? Great. Okay, I have a comment, and I'll probably have questions later. As always, I enjoyed listening to you all. Y'all are very conscious. However, when you were mentioning days, we should all be up in arms when they say gay pride, gay rights. Gays have no rights. Gay is an inappropriate behavior that people choose to take upon themselves and do. And as far as when President Obama wanted to rethink and say gays had rights, we just need to simply follow.
about the money. Okay. And to know better is to do better regardless. Who tell us a lie? Why would we follow that lie regardless what his color is? Okay. Who's your question for, Dr. Umar Johnson or just Joe Brown or both? Uh, well, I'm going well, to call to Umar Johnson first, and then I got a question for... Um, I'm going to call him Judge Dr. Joe Brown. <laughs> That's what he is. <laughs> call him what he is. Okay. Uh, All right. Dr. Johnson, last week I, I got the tail end of it. I was busy and time ran away from me. But, however, when you were talking about the neighborhood, uh, how we need to take back the neighborhood, I want to revisit that. Because the neighborhoods are nothing we need. We need okay. to take back the community. All right, let me help Wait. you out with that. He's saying that he can't hear you. Dr. Umar it's Johnson. Not heard of, Baba. It's y'all in the studio. Y'all did something to the controls because I can't hear the callers and I can't hear Judge Joe Brown either. I can hear him fine in the beginning, but then something happened. It's not them because her level is the same level as the judge, and they're in two different places. So I think it's something with the master controls, like the volume is down or... Because it, it kind of just went out earlier. I can hear okay. I can hear the host clear. I can hear okay. you clear, loud and clear, but I cannot Sed hear the judge, and I Sed cannot hear the callers hardly at all. I'll tell you what a question is. Said, can you check that volume inside there or whatever the problem Can you is? hear me better now? I can hear you. I can hear you better okay, now. Okay, I was on my speaker in another room, but I'm... Okay, I can hear you now. All right. I was it's saying better. to Dr... Uh, Johnson last week. Yes. When we, when you all were talking about take the neighborhood, I feel that we need to revisit that. We need to leave that neighborhood exactly where it is and we need to recreate the community. Because having grown up in a community, there were cohesiveness. There were uh, jobs within the community. There were black pride. There okay. were accountability and responsibility. Right. Okay, that is something that... The worst thing in the world was that fussing. Okay. And that messed us up. And I feel that uh, maybe these schools that they have closed down in the community, we might need to pool our resources together and purchase them and back. Okay. the structure that we once had in the community. Okay. Dr. Umar Johnson, just in case, essentially she's saying no, taking... Okay, go ahead, sir. Uh, to that I would say I'm not against that idea, but we do have to keep in mind that people tend to relocate to places where they can get employment. Yes. So if we're going to recreate the black community, we need to make sure that we're offering economic opportunities for black people because otherwise they will not relocate, number one, and even if they do relocate, they won't be there long because people tend to move where it is most convenient for them to acquire employment. That's how we ended up in the northern states in the first place right. during the Great Migration. So we have to make sure that we have an economic system that provides opportunities that can create infrastructure and keep people employed. Without that, we will not be able to keep our people's attention. Let me say this quickly. The biggest reason why we as black people cannot demand loyalty from our own community is because we don't provide opportunities for mm -hmm. our community. In mm -hmm. fact, we're the only non-white group in the country that does not systematically provide opportunities for its own people. Until we change that economic fact, it's going to be difficult for us to start holding our own accountable. That is true. Economic base. Let's take a comment from Omar and then go to you, uh, Judge Joe Brown. I want to make a couple of comments. Uh, you Go know ahead. what? The, the church, uh, as, as Dr. Joe Brown said, was, um, you know, is letting people do what they want to do and just, you know, just believe. The, but the book says, come as you are. Mm -hmm. But you can't stay that way. Right. <laughs> you can't stay a pimp, a hoe, a drug dealer. It don't work like that. Right. So, so uh, the the other thing I wanted to make make a point is, is that uh, whoever controls the mind of the people mm -hmm. will control the activity. Right now, the media is controlling our minds. We don't have much control at all over the media. 
And because we don't have the control, the songs we hear, the movies we see, those things is putting, they're putting thoughts in the people's minds and they're out operating based on those, on that thinking. Mm-hmm. And until we get control of the media, then it's going to be very difficult to control the behavior. Okay. So how do we do that? I'm, and I'm asking both, both of my, 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 you know, my experts in this field. How do we do that? Okay. I'll go quickly before the judge if I can. Go, go ahead, sir. We, we, we don't have, we don't control the media and we won't be able to change it. This is a predominantly non-American African country. So we will never get control of the mainstream media. What we need to do is create our own alternative media system so that we can reprogram our people the way that they need to be done. For example, Tyler Perry, I commend him with the power move he just made, creating his own studio from the ground, which is larger than most of the white major studios, by the way. Tyler Perry, for example, because I'm not going to put the sole responsibility on him, because I think we do that too much with our celebrities. But Tyler Perry is in a position where he could start turning out regular consistent, systematic, empowering content for the black community, man, woman, and child. That's the direction that we need to go in. But let me also say that we, we spend more time on the television and the computer yes. and the cell phone than most other groups put together. Yes. And the reason for that is every other ethnic community in America has an agenda that they have to fulfill. They don't have time to spend all day on the TV mm-hmm. or the Internet or the cell phone. Mm-hmm. Black people don't have a black agenda. Mm-hmm. So most of us are just existing. And because we're just existing, we can waste all of our time on TV and Internet because we don't have anything important to attend to. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. We've got Horace Taylor in the studio with us, Judge Joe Brown, the unlikely candidate. And I think he has... Uh, some questions for you. So I'll, I'll go to him, let him present his questions, and then give you time to address uh, one, two, or three uh, questions, if you will, sir. Go ahead, Harris. Uh, thank you so much. So actually the question that I am formulating, but uh, let me digress from that question because uh, the comment that was just stated, the black agenda, mm-hmm. if you would, can you expound on that? Because I'm sure all of us as black men, we have an idea what is meant by the black agenda, and subsequently, what happens to that black agenda? Are we feel fearful of implementing what we believe to be the black agenda, or are we so concerned with a, a, a non-functioning black black agenda, as in it's not going to be homogenous to all black people? And that's for Dr. Umar Johnson. Yes. Go ahead, Dr. Umar Johnson. Yes, indeed. Uh, number one. The black agenda, in many respects, mirrors the five-headed monster that we're fighting. Miseducation, that means we have to have our own educational system. Gentrification, we have to have our own real estate and community protection system. Mm -hmm. Police genocide, we got to have our own community defense system. Access to wealth, we have to have our own economic empowerment and financial opportunity system, mass incarceration, we have to have our own criminal justice system, Mm -hmm. a culturally based system whereby our elders, through and council of elders, can mediate conflicts between black folks so we don't have to go to the white man's court, i.e. child support and custody court, because family court is destroying. The white man's family court is literally destroying the relationship between black men and black women. With that being said, the black agenda, whether you're rich, whether you're working class, college educated or poor, should remain the same because those five things are relevant to you no matter how much money or education that you have. Number two, the reason why the black agenda is in the condition that it's in is because it has been controlled and dictated and held hostage by the NAACP, Mm. the Urban League, the Congressional Black Caucus, black politicians, the black church, i.e. the black bourgeoisie. As long as the black bourgeoisie are going to be the custodians of the black agenda, then the black agenda will always be up for sale to the highest bidder. All right. I'll make a quick comment and then go to judge. You know, Marcus Garvey said that 
many years ago, Dr. Johnson, that the NAACP was designed to destroy anything that black people were attempting to do. Judge Joe Brown, I want to go to you and want you to discuss uh, economic uh, development as we have proceeded to do. And while you're at it, respond to uh, the previous question. Go ahead, sir. All right. I'm in Atlanta right now. I'm here on some business. Yes. And I'm looking at three black communities, three separate black communities. There is the one you see popularly on Atlanta Housewives. Yeah. There is a mass of black people who aren't doing so well. Some are doing well, and they have a totally different agenda. And then there's a third black agenda that seems to be thriving. That is the black gay agenda. It's Atlanta. And they look like they've got a coherent thing going on. And the housewife thing with the social circle around that looks like it does too. But the one that looks like it would be something for mainstream black folk does not. And the agenda, I think, is kind of nebulous because what is the agenda supposed to be? Now, if you took the one I had, it would be kind of ruthless and kind of violent and imposed. Whether like what, for instance? Not. Yeah, well, I'm just saying some of the things I would impose <laughs> would not be liked by many, and I wouldn't give people choices if I had my uh, say-so. Mm. Uh, cleaning up the black neighborhoods, cleaning up the black uh, lifestyle, enforcing certain things, uh, certain edicts, and enforcing certain demands. But one thing we have to do is this world since the middle of the last ice age has been tied up in commerce and trade. Hmm. It's interactive. And if we want to get someplace, we've got to get away from the social sciences and get into science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, STEM. That's like the dot-com revolution, like uh you see all of the high science stuff. That's where the market is not glutted because the things have not occurred yet. So there's no market. There's a market for them when they occur, but there's nobody glutting the market and trying to satisfy the demand because these things have yet to be invented. We've got to start inventing some things, and we've got some smart youth. If you go to the Science Channel or... You can see some very, very intelligent, beautiful black women are in the science. You can see some very intelligent black men who are into these sciences. They work for NASA. They work for themselves. They do great things, but we don't even put them out for the kids to hide in. They don't look like they're alien. If you walk down the street, ladies, you might turn around and look at them. And the guys look like they could fit in, and they talk just like everybody else talks, but we don't push this. We all talk about setting up a business in something where the market is glutted, where you want to set up a corner grocery, but you got Kroger. You you want to set up a gas station, what are you going to do with that? you got to get in with Exxon, BP, or Gulf, or something like that, or Shell. You want to set up something else, you got to fit into a market that's already glutted and people have been in it so long that they've got huge amounts of capital they can throw at anything and they can outlast you, outspend you, out advertise you. We've got to get off into adventuring and developing something. I don't even like the man, but Booker T. Washington said you needed to develop a work ethic. Uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, who I do like for some of his thoughts, he said, you've got to start using your head and outsmarting your adversary. And you need to take that talented 10th and bootstrap up the race, but the talented 10th is running somewhere else and scared to rock the boat. I practiced law for a long time, but I'm rather disappointed with the young black lawyers. They are all about money. They won't take a case for a cause. And most of the black lawyers I grew up around and about or I was exposed to in my formative years, we all were about this thing that we have an obligation to use what we know to advance the race. And I don't see that anymore. Okay. And I see a thing, too, where we lack balls. 
You've got to have cojones. You've got to be willing to take a risk for something. Mm -hmm. You've got to be willing to put it on the line. But we all have this thing about everybody's got to be so damn safe because we got raised by mothers, not fathers. Mm -hmm. We want us to be nice little good boys Mm -hmm. so we can give them some grandchildren and we can stay out of trouble keeping our nose clean. But they never told us about, you know, sometimes, you know, well, like the Spartan mothers used to tell their sons, come back with your shield on it, boy. Do not run. You do or die for the people. We don't have that. Mm -hmm. And... It, it's some ideation that can be changed. Now, there is hope. I studied propaganda in college years ago, and there are some propaganda methods that we can use, that we have the ability to impose, that can turn things around in one extent to get us to think right. I recall the late 60s when there was the power fist and the afro and the beard and everybody was going power to the people right on Mm -hmm. and then we went downhill from there and we still haven't climbed back up to that plateau which we needed to take off and go further from but we didn't for a number of reasons but those things became fads they spread through the common lexicon and we can do it again we just have to start focusing with small groups who put stuff out there they become popular they expand I conducted this uh, an experiment on Twitter. Twitter's got these algorithms that will block you if you get to talking about trannies and all of this queer behavior that they have that they're trying to impose on the children. So I came up with skip. All right, that's the camera. They want you to feel the rainbow, and people get it, but it escapes Twitter's algorithm. So now a whole bunch of people on Twitter are calling them skittles and taste in the rainbow, you know, so that is something that just, I started, and it didn't take but six weeks, as predicted by the political science stuff I studied, is to take hold. Mm-hmm. So you can do that, and I, that was just an experiment I ran, and we can come up with other stuff like that as, as people, so we can start getting us to ideate ourselves to ideate properly. Okay. You gotta think right. Sure. Let me go to Dr. Umar Johnson because you, you mentioned trade and commerce. Commerce. And earlier, Dr. Umar Johnson, you, you had mentioned the di- different trade skills that would get us into economic growth and development. So l- I want to hear from you on trade and com- commerce, and then I want us to transition to talking about your black parenting upcoming event and see how we can put something uh, Yes, together. indeed. Three yes, quick sir. points on the trade and commerce. Number one, when you look around most of America's major cities, nearly all of the new construction projects are being built by white, which has always been the case. But now we see increasingly hmm. Chinese. Yeah. Okay, and Mexican labor yeah. on these projects. So the Chinese and the Mexicans are coming in and getting the licenses as plumbers, electricians, carpenters, masons, and they're doing the work that black men used to do 75, 80 years ago. So we are literally being uh, economically devastated in part due to the fact that the black community itself is promoting college over and above mm-hmm. a trade skill education. Mm-hmm. So you need skills to pay bills. Not information. <clears throat> you need skills to pay bills. <clears throat> College gives you information, but it is the trade programs that give you skills. So we need to definitely revert back to a skills-based education if we're going to save black men. There is a direct relationship between the amount of black men who started going to college instead of trade school and the amount of black men who are ending up in jail. A lot of these brothers who are being arrested for selling drugs, many of them have college degrees. Many of them are not high school dropouts. They have college degrees. Mm -hmm. So that's number one. And on the second point, the black America doesn't have a manufacturing sector. We produce nothing. And we might be the only ethnic group that doesn't produce anything. So we have to get a manufacturing sector, and then we need a distribution sector, because in manufacturing and distribution is where we can provide the most amount of jobs for our people. Mm -hmm. Do we have a call, Isaac? Okay, we're coming uh, up against the clock, King of Pop. Go ahead, sir. I enjoy the show today. 
Thank you. The only thing I have to, the only thing I have to say is the Willie Lynch theory has a lot to do with what's going on. And I agree with this 1970 welfare system. A lot of our sisters are welfare minded. And believe it or not, there are women out there that would have kids that have children and would rather just raise their kids without that, even if the man is a good, strong black man because she's had, she has been conditioned by the system. And I hope you all have this segment again. And I've learned a lot today. Thank you. All right, Horace Taylor, then Omar, and then back to our esteemed guest. Go ahead, Horace Taylor. Yes, I'd like to address one more time the uh, black agenda. I'm I'm curious from this standpoint, right? If there was a black presidential candidate speaking and talking to the black agenda, how how do you think the black Americans will gravitate towards that candidate or not? Simply because that person is focused on the black agenda. Okay, Omar. You know, great. Uh, oh, that was that wasn't for me. That's another Omar, correct? I'm well, Omar. But, well, you okay, you Omar, and he's <laughs> Omar. <laughs> Got it. So here's and here's here's the plan now. Uh, Horace, Omar, however many questions and comments they can put out there, then we'll go to Judge Joe Brown and back to you. And you may have two or three questions to address. How's that for a plan? Go ahead, Omar. You, you know, I, every day I get people qualified to buy homes, and I'm 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 I'm, speak, I'm, I'm going back to what uh, Doctor Mark Johnson said. There are people that have degrees and don't make any money. Yeah. But there are people that have skills and make twice as much money than the person with the degree. <laughs> so uh, when I was going into the prison, my thing was let's get the skills and turn that into a business because that way you ain't got to check a damn box that you've been locked up or whatever. You can go out there in the marketplace and market your skills and make more money than the person that went to, to Harvard and got him a degree. I think we need to go back to that because back in my day, that's how it was. You got skills in auto mechanics, skills in carpentry, skills in, in, in plumbing and heating. And you can make good money, more than the teachers will make, and, you, and that's still true today. We got to go back to that and get out of this mindset that you got to accumulate fifty or $100,000 worth of student loans and you can't do nothing with the paper that you walk out to school with. And yeah, we're facing many tricks is what I call them. Go ahead, Judge Brown. Judge Joe Brown. Yep. Let me say something about that. I can do a whole lot of stuff with my hands, cast metal, make radios and stuff like that, work with leather. That's because I went to a school system. It was Los Angeles City Schools back when I went, and they tried to put all blacks in those things where we could work with our hands, and they said we wouldn't be as happy working with our minds. Now, it's good. But you have to be careful of the downside, which is they use it to sidetrack young blacks from being able to do the academic thing. They did everything they could. I even had a, a, a teacher in the 11th grade who wanted to flunk all of the black students taking an advanced composition class because he said we'd be happier working with our hands. So it's a solution but it's also a trap, so you have to be aware of it. It's what you call the two-edged sword. It can swing both ways. Okay. So we have to keep that in mind. Yeah, vocational skills are important, but let's not take our minds and sabotage them and put all of them in this kind of thing. We need it, but there have to be options. I see. You're talking about striking a balance. Yes. Yeah, not too far either way. Now, uh, Brother Harvest Taylor wants to know, how do you think black people will respond to a presidential candidate talking about economic development? Was that it, economic development? And black, uh, black agenda, was that it, Harvest? Correct, with the okay. black agenda focus. Black agenda focus. Go ahead, sir. Well, in the scheme of things, whoever becomes president has to operate in a political landscape that demands certain give and take uh, activity. So we won't get everything we want from anybody. You can't because we're not the only group in this country. 
we are in a position where in about 30, 35 years, the situation will be such that there will no longer be a majority white nation that we have to contend with. And the largest minority at that point will become the Hispanics. So just think about that in terms of what the new landscape is going to look like politically. We'll probably be the third largest minority group behind uh, Hispanics, whites, and then us. Mm -hmm. And that's going to cause a shift in dynamics. So we have to start thinking appropriately, and that means we have to start countering some of this hip-hop thought process. I know people say that's the contribution of this generation of black folk is hip-hop, but, you know, we think in terms of music and sports. We don't think in terms of something else. We don't think in terms of sacrifice, hard work, and being out being a soldier for the cause. Mm -hmm. We don't think about that anymore. Mm -hmm. Dr. Umar Johnson. Sir, here's my response. I think black Americans, American Africans, would respond favorably to a national black presidential election as long as they are guaranteed that economic opportunity will come from it. And I don't think that would be a problem because we would need to structure the process and the institution and the system in such a way that there would be a black tax. Every American African would voluntarily, okay, uh, uh, commit to a black tax that would be paid to handle the salary of not only the president, but the entire cabinet, as well as any other officers and employees that we would need to take care of the business of black America. I think most of our people would willingly give money to a system that we create if they know that at least their children would benefit from it. All right, and and that makes me think about your parenting. I don't remember your exact words last week, Dr. Umar Johnson, but what is your uh, your 50-state parenting event you're working on? Uh, I think it's a great yes, time to start talking about that. Yes, sir. Uh, it is the 50-state NIBPA. NIBPA is National Independent Black Parent Association, 50 state NIBPA, know your rights, know your educational rights, black parent tour. I want to go to every state in the country, every single one in 2020 to educate the black parents who care about protecting and saving their children on everything they need to know about mental health and miseducation from A to Z. That is vaccinations, that is autism, that is learning disability, that is IEP, that is psychological evaluation, that is diagnosis, that is DSM, that is change of placement, that is report cards, that's suspension, that's expulsion, it's due process. Everything you need to know to protect your child from the mental health establishment and the miseducation establishment, I want to come and train you. And anyone listening to today's interview who would like to host the statewide training where they live at, can get in contact with me through the website, drumarjohnson.com, by way of email, drumarjohnson at yahoo.com, or by way of telephone, 844-DR-UMAR, or 215-989-9858. All right. Um, you just mentioned some of the highlights, and I will be in touch with, I'll be in touch with <coughs> both of you throughout the week, and I uh, want to learn more about that so that uh, we may participate as well. Um, we've got Cedric Kerberson here. You good, Cedric? Yes, sir. Question or comment real quick? Oh, man. I know you have thoughts running through your head. Oh, no, I mean, I'm enjoying the, uh, the dialogue. I mean, uh, it's just uh, so much so much information being passed around today. Release, I, I think, I think, release uh, some of those thoughts. There we go. There we go. <laughs> All right. So now we've got Bill Cosby locked up. Well, we don't have him locked up, but uh, <laughs> the system has, has him locked up. I wanted to, before we go, uh, Judge Joe Brown and Dr. Umar Johnson, discuss Bill, Cosby, Bill Cosby's situation briefly. And we have, how much time do we have, Cedric? It's now 11.17. We're coming uh, close up against the clock. Back to you, Judge Joe Brown. What do you think about Bill Cosby? I and what does it take to get him uh, out, out, if you agree I with that? 
I thought the trial was a travesty, and I thought the whole process was a travesty, and it was an example of a modern-day lynch mob uh, going forth. It was too much influence being had by outside interest in the outcome of the trial and in the trial proceedings itself. It was a disgrace to American law. It really was. The judge took months to do what he only had a small, small amount of time to do to make sure that Cosby spent time in jail. It was obvious that the court was biased and took the side of the uh, screaming thems out there who wanted Cosby's head. And in the background, you have to understand the big picture was this was the second time that Cosby was getting ready to acquire NBC, a major network entity, which would have given our African Americans, black folk, you know, ADOS, a whole slew of options in terms of reaching out to the people. So this was not just a blow against Bill Cosby. This was not a blow for Hashtag Me Too. This was a direct attack and a direct assault and a huge blow against the interest of black people in this country. That's what it really was. Okay. Dr. Omar Johnson, how do you see that situation? Is Three this, does this, does this point. represent the overall picture facing black men? Go ahead, sir. Uh, partly it does. Uh, but it's not so much about Bill Cosby's behavior as it was about our behavior. And what I mean by that is black America put off, put up almost no fight to let the American power structure know that you will not do this to Bill Cosby. There was almost no resistance to it. I think black men were afraid because they did not want to be branded as being against women and supportive of sexual abuse. Black women were conflicted in their uh, obligation to protect the black community, but at the same time push forward the feminist agenda. And so Bill Cosby's crucifixion is largely due to the fact that black America did not stand up in his defense publicly. That's number one. Number two, it also speaks to the fact that black men need to stay the hell away from white females. That's number two. <laughs> and number three, I praise the, the Lord. The real reason Bill Cosby was lynched <laughs> is not so much that he wanted to purchase a major network, but the home that Bill Cosby and his wife own is sitting on top of what a lot of land developers believe is a large untapped oil reservoir. They want Bill Cosby to go broke so he has to sell his home so they can acquire the home and exploit the oil that they believe is under the home. That's the real reason Bill Cosby is in jail. Mm. And so uh, this is Philadelphia. This Is that right? Absolutely. And that's Born where and raised all Philly, me and Bill Cosby. <laughs> and we've got Cedric Curbson here too. Hey, he's from Philadelphia. Is that right, Cedric? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Born and raised, right? Uh, born and raised. <laughs> Been all over the travel, but right there, from right there, huh? Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> Uh, been in, uh, in in each other's company a few times okay, already. Okay. Okay. Good. Now you will see this, and when O.J. Simpson, oftentimes these guys they get in trouble, and they not saying this is what happened to Bill Cosby. I think Bill Bill Cos Cosby represent a good prototype for black men. But w when you say this whole interracial thing is problematic for black people. Uh, let's hear from Judge Joe Brown on that. Well, how, how much time do we have? Look, go, go ahead, sir. We've been here 400 plus years. <laughs> There's been a consistent thing about where we're supposed to be in this society, and consistently we don't like it. I think one of the problems we have about getting out of it is that. We serve as the precarious scapegoat for America whenever it has trouble times. In other words, where things are going bad or they feel stressed out, they can always blame us yeah. and rally around their particular brand of flag. And that's yeah. what they do often. So we've got to do something to escape that. And I have some ideas, but it would take too long to lay them out. And basically, it just boils down to being men and women as historically defined for all people. It's pretty universal and has gone back as long as anybody has recorded and even before that. So we just have to get back to manhood, not just 
but we need to get back to manhood, womanhood, nuclear family, because that's the foundation for everything. And if we don't have that on a solid basis, then nothing else is going to work because our foundation is weak. Mm -hmm. And Omar, Omar Baruti, question for you. How would you sum up today's show? It's an interesting, informative <laughs> show that covers a topic that is needful. We have to face some things, and we're going to have to start being very critical so we can see what's actually gone wrong so we'll know what to correct. Women are not going to be off limits. Children are not going to be off limits. And certainly men aren't going to be off right. limits. But we have to criticize the whole big picture so we can know what to do to turn it around. And it's going to be nasty, but we just have to do it. Okay, we've, we've got a few more minutes left. Omar, I was asking you that question because the next time we have these two experts on, I, we've done. We've spent the last two shows analyzing with some solutions, but the next time I hope that we can go into more solution-oriented uh, show the next time. So that's why I pose that question to you. What do you think? You know, you know, we're losing our children, especially our black male children, and we need to do something about it. I mean, we got to take some drastic actions. And the things in the past that have, have been put in place are still operating today. That's, that's why we have such a high incarceration rate, a high unemployment rate. And with robots coming in and taking the, the menial labor jobs, it's going to get worse. Mm -hmm. So we can't wait any longer. Mm -hmm. we got to do something now. we got to put the plan together now and move forward now. We can't wait for some you know mythical person to come and save us. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And so you're no longer going into the prisons teaching, is that right? I'm going back into the prison. We'll, we'll be going back. I'll be going back into the prison okay. teaching. And you speak because act, you know my my son got his PhD degree in chemical biology, but mm -hmm. I know everybody's not made. It's not made to do that. Right. There are too many p people in that prison, and some have gotten out. They're truck drivers. They're plumbers. They're doing things because in, inside the prison setting, they were inspired to hey, I can do something else with my you know with my time, mm -hmm. and they made something out of themselves. Mm -hmm. I love that. Mm -hmm. And they call me and tell me what they're doing. I love that. But everybody's not made for the, the academics. Mm -hmm. And if you're not made for it, don't worry about it. This world still has a place for you to operate and make a good living for yourself and your family. On a scale of 1 to 10, what has been your individual success rate? On a scale of 1 to 10? Yes. I stay at a 10. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, when, when I was okay. going, no, I didn't know. I didn't realize how much I was going. I was going to the prison 100 times a year. Okay. <laughs> And I was going to any prison that would let me come in and teach the business class how to, how to set it up, how to incorporate it, ideas on how to structure it, how to go to the marketplace and make it work. Uh, even my wife, I mean, that, that she's in business. Mm -hmm. And I look, I go everywhere I can think to go and, okay. and, and inspire people to try to make them come on, let's do this thing, because you can do it. All right, we're up against the clock, and that was an individual question. And let me hear, we've got uh, four minutes, less than four minutes, real quick. Strength in numbers, Dr. Umar Johnson, that was an individual question, uh, but do you agree with the concept or the idea, cliche or whatever you want to call it, of strength in numbers? And what are your thoughts, a couple of minutes each of you, on building numbers? We're talking about human beings, black people as resources, strength in numbers. Real quick, sir. Umar, Dr. Umar Johnson. What happened to him? Is it he's gone, Isaac? We lost him? He's still on the phone. Uh, he hasn't hung up, so unless he's stepped away from the phone. Okay. Uh, uh, Judge Joe Brown is still on the line. All right. Judge Joe Brown, can you talk about that before we go? Uh, briefly? Yes. Yes, I can. <laughs> sure you can. See, it requires H-A-R-D work, hard work. And if you walk around, you hear too often the youth talking about how they're going to make it the easy way. They don't realize that's the hard way, and there's nothing that's going to come to anybody. Come Rich on. or broke besides the hard way. Tell it, tell it's it. Hard as the devil being broke, 
but it's a lot of hard work not being broke. Yeah. Oh, you're going to get the hard any way you do it, H-A-R-D. Either a hard time or hard work. The choice is yours. And for the youth that may be listening to this, it's called K-12, through kindergarten through 12th grade. You get that ace, and the doors will be open. They may not be open very far. You might have to kick them all the way open, but at least they won't be locked to you. So K-12, through get it together. You know, I don't care whether you think teach is on your agenda or not. Get that magic they have for you. That's the foundation. 